So we've been talking about this thing about the flesh and the spirit and learning how to walk in the spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh and the battle, the war that goes on between the flesh and the spirit and how important that is, especially in the day and time that you are now. If you're in the spiritual realm, remember also Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, principalities, power, spiritual wickedness, rulers of darkness and high places. So if that's the situation that occurs, you have to recognize that when you're in the spiritual realm of things, you're a little closer to God. And when you're closer to God, you're closer to the spiritual entities, including the devil. So to not be prepared for that or to not be aware of that is sort of a foolish thing on your part. He is one of your enemies. He is your arch enemy in the sense of wanting, since he can't take your soul, he would do everything in the world that he possibly could do to try to destroy your fellowship with the Lord. And importantly, to understand that to rob you of your joy. Amen. You say, why? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. And so the board says in the book of Deuteronomy, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with gladness of heart and joyfulness, I'll put upon thee a yoke of iron. In other words, he'll allow the devil, the yoke of iron to be on you because he can take your strength away. The joy that we're talking about there is not this kind of joy where it's equated to happiness. The joy that we're talking about there is, is that it's something that runs much deeper than that. It doesn't always put a smile on your face on the outside. Uh, but sometimes you can be going through trouble and difficulties and things like that. And in the inside, you know, you realize, hey, you know what? The Lord is still with me and the Lord is still behind me and the Lord is still helping me. And you quote the verses that you need to quote. But along those lines, oftentimes what gets muddied, what gets uh, messed up is that line between learning to listen to the flesh and listen to the spirit. And the confusion comes in when somebody says, your heart, thinking about your heart, thinking about your heart, your heart, your heart. What does your heart do? What does your heart do? In the Bible, the heart, and only in a couple of occasions, is actually referring to the muscle that is in the middle of or the center of your chest. That's an organ about the size of your fist. And that pretty much is true no matter how big you're a, a man or a woman you are. It probably the size of your fist is about the size of where your heart is. And so it's located over, I guess these doctors and nurses in here can tell you, but it's located a little bit over more toward your left side. And so oftentimes you'll wind up having jaw pain or you'll have arm uh, pain. And the reason for that is you're having a heart attack. But what I want to talk to you about and try my best to explain to you is give you some verses that your heart, when the Lord refers to it, has to do with your mind, it has to do with your conscience, it has to do with the things that you think with. You can't think with this organ. The heart has to do with what's between your ears. And the Lord wants to control that and the devil wants to control that. So what do I do? I have to learn to operate under the utilization of a filter that means that when things come in, I have to filter it correctly. And when things go out, it has to be filtered. If you don't use that filter in the proper manner and you don't see things the way the Lord would have you to see things, you'll, you'll naturally respond quickly in a flash sometimes of anger and a flash sometimes, like he says in Ephesians chapter number four, that you'll come at it and the next thing you know, out comes the evil speaking and out comes the, the malice and out comes you know the clamor, the, the loudness and all that. That's, that's just your flesh responding because your natural response in the flesh is you get popped, you want to pop back without thinking. And it's hard sometimes to put your mind in gear. But if you learn to filter it through your heart, you might be a little slower in your response and then the response, the retort back to you might be somewhat different. Let me see if I can demonstrate for you. Look in Psalms chapter number 14. And this goes along with the flesh and the spirit. Why? Because it matters how you think. How you think controls your actions, and your actions ultimately control where you're headed or your destiny. As a man thinketh in his what? Well, how can you think with a muscle? See, it's thinking up here. If the Lord can't control what's between your ears, what I've referred to before years ago as your engine, if the Lord can't control your engine, He can't control what direction the car goes in. He can't control whether or not you put it in, uh, in, in park or whether you put it in reverse or whether you put it in drive or in low or four-wheel low. He can't control a, a, a transfer case. He can't control the transmission. He can't control anything. Why? If the engine doesn't work, it doesn't matter what you do with any of the other stuff. So you're literally at a stalemate. You're locked in the position where you are. So oftentimes what happens in the Christian life is, is individuals get stuck right where they are. You say, why? The problem's the engine. 
So they got a fuel tank of gas, you know, and they got, you know, special nitric oxide in there to be able to push them faster than other things. And their fuel injectors are all cleaned out. Everything's running perfectly. The transmission's got plenty of fluid in it. And if you got a clutch press plate throughout bearing, all that stuff's brand new, ready to operate, ready to go gear. You can sit in there and you can make noises like an engine, but the car ain't going nowhere. I mean, outside everything is metallic. It's beautiful. You can make it, you know, uh, make it metallic blue or make it candy apple red. And you can have button and tucked or rolled and pleated seats in it. You can have all the most beautiful plushest carpet in the world, best stereo system in the world. And uh, the battery can be charged up and run all the system. And you go by and look at it. And there's Krager mags. And you got, you know, two four-barrel Harbelt Holly sitting up on top there. And you open that thing up. And you got uh, chrome underneath there with chrome valve covers. And, boy, you look at that thing. You think, boy, this is is really something. Yeah, but what about when you turn it on? If the engine's not running, it don't matter how good it looks. Now, it's important for you to understand. You say, why? You'll get a message this morning. It'll be about mothers, but it'll apply to all of us. But the thing that you have to recognize is, is just looking like a good car don't make you a good car. I remember a guy one time that went out and he had a little old stinking, uh, you know, like a, like a, uh, Oh, what was the car? It was called it. It was a uh, road. No, Plymouth Duster. Duster. That's what it was. And the thing had rust and all kind of stuff on the outside and that kind of a deal. That guy went all around that town and he'd pull up next to these cars. And I mean, look like they just rolled off the showroom floor, boy. I mean, and they'd run in those days. They'd run for, you know, $50 a run and that kind of a deal like that. And when you looked at that thing, you'd think to yourself, because they're looking on the outside, you'd think, well, that, that, car, that car ain't worth nothing. <laughs> There ain't no way that car, my car's got everything it can have on it. <coughs> and from the outside, if you were to put them side by side, every time, you know what you'd pick? You'd pick the one that looked the best. Sure. Time and time again, at least six races that I know of, and I'm not condoning the racing and that kind of a deal. I'm not telling you to go out and be a street racer, just an illustration. Time and time again, at least a half a dozen times that I know of, that guy'd line up on the line, and sometimes the other guy'd get the jump or might even jump them when they drop the rag or drop their hand or whatever. Time after time, that guy would smoke them. I mean, just literally, I mean, blow by them two, three car lengths at a time. The problem was that nobody ever took the time to look under the hood. See, all they did is look on the outside. Now, what some of you do is you spend a lot of time looking at everybody else's situation and you wonder how come people are beating you by two and three car lengths when they don't look as good as you and they don't act as good as you. Yeah, but their engine's finely tuned. And what keeps these old people around here and keeps them coming and keeps them, they got a good engine. They may not look the same way. Some of them, you know, look like a pair with, a, you know, a, maybe a couple of pipe cleaners for legs and things like that. And that happens with age. What keeps them around, they got a good Egypt. Don't, don't be fooled by outward appearances. The Pharisees, if you were to look at them, you'd say, man, they got it. Boy, they got it. You know what the Lord said? You stink like a dead man's bones. <laughs> you know what he said about them? On the outside, you're like a whited sepulcher. But I'm looking on the inside. Now, what the Lord's interested in is your heart. He's not interested in your skin color. He's not interested in the length of your hair and length of your mustache or your beard. He's not interested in your clothing and all the other kind of stuff. If you turn your heart over to the Lord, everything else falls in line. Too often what people are more interested in is trying to have this one-on-one -on -one relationship with other people instead of a relationship with God. If some of you, I'm looking down here at the floor so nobody take this too personal. If some of you would spend more time in your relationship with the Lord, you'd be surprised how your relationship with other people would improve. The reason that many of you have problems with other people is you're too focused on other people. You have to focus on your relationship with the Lord. What you see in other people oftentimes is what the Lord sees in you. And you won't ever pause to think, I might be the problem. Imagine that. You come to church on Mother's Day and you just got the, oh, I'm the problem. See, that's why I don't like to go over there. It's always my fault. I'd rather go to the church down the street. There's always everybody else's fault. It's the economy. It's the Ukrainians. It's the Russians. It's, you know, it's Putin. It's whatever the other guy's name is. It's the guy in the White House. It's this and that and the other. That's a cheap way to look at things. Amen. The way to look at things is, is, you know what, Lord, I need to work on my relationship with you. And if you do that, you know what happens? You get your heart fixed. And then you're able to have the relationship with others you should have. All right, look at this thing, if you will, please, in the book of Psalms. You say, well, preacher, that just sounds a little bit condemning. No, no, it's not. It's helpful. Yes, sir. 
if you hear it with the right filter. What benefit is it for me to tell you what I just told you? Does that make more offerings come in? Does it make me liked more? No, but it's the truth. And so the issue will be when you get to heaven, it won't be how'd you get along with everybody around you. The issue will be how'd you get along with Him. Nobody around you is getting you to heaven and giving you a pass when you get there. You're not going to have a person vouch for you when you get up to heaven and go, Hey, Lord, you know what? Me and him, I mean, we were like tight. The Lord's like, okay, let me check. Gabriel, is, is he the one that owns this place up here? No. Michael, let me ask you a couple of questions. Is he the one that died on the cross for him? No. Okay, that name doesn't mean anything to me up here. No matter how bad you'd like to step into somebody's place and say, I want to vouch for them. You can't vouch for them. You know who's vouching for you? Jesus Christ. Amen. The name that is above every name. Yes, sir. Why am I getting there? Uh, because of Jesus. Amen. You'd be surprised who's going to be in there. You look at him, you say, Plymouth Duster. <laughs> that thing can't run nothing. My Lord said, it's my duster. He don't care what it looks like. All right, notice in Psalms chapter number 14 and verse number 1, the Bible said, The fool hath said where? There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. Um, uh, there is none that doeth good. All right, now the Lord said that there's a heart here that has the ability to think. The fool has said in his heart, that's in the deepest recesses of your mind. Come to Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9. So I want to get the point across here with running a few of these scriptures that you, you're thinking with your mind as you would try to say it, but it's actually your heart. So if what goes in your uh, eye affects your heart, it's not affecting your muscle. It's affecting how you see things. Give me, give me just a moment here now to expound on that just a smidgen. If you don't think that's true, if you continue to watch something on a regular basis, you can get hardened to it. So for years and years and years, we would hear it in churches. Somebody walked through a mall and happened to see two uh, queers, homosexuals, same-sexers, whatever you want to call them, and they were having a make-out session to make everybody, you know, and everybody would shiver and tremble like, ah, oh, man. And nowadays you walk by and you don't think nothing of it. If you're in school anymore, you're not allowed to say anything about it. I mean, that's a strange thing. I, I appreciate, believe it or not, what DeSantis is trying to do uh, and those kind of things. I, I mean, he's going to get a lot of pushback on the deal. But this idea of trying to train people to think that way, the world is on to something Christians have yet to capture. They realize if they can get you to think a certain way, they can control your destiny. They can control how you do things. They are literally training people that will be your grandkids later on that will be in, in charge of the country. You say, what are they doing? They learned a long time ago. They took a, a, a page out of Stalin's playbook and what they realized in Hitler's playbook and Mao Zedong's playbook. We start them when they're children. Why do you think the Bible says train up a child in the way he should go? You say, well, that doesn't always come out right. Oh, okay, all right. You know what? There's exceptions to all the rule. But you, at least you give the kid the best opportunity to turn out right. You're giving him a choice. But you know what the Lord says? You ought to tell him. I, I, don't, I don't have a problem. A lady asked me one time. She said, what do you think about uh, uh, reading the Bible to my baby? Uh, her baby is still in the womb. And I said, I think it's a great idea. She said, well, I mean, do you really think? I said, I don't know. John the Baptist saw Jesus and leapt. <laughs> And I said, he was in the womb. I said, what do I think about it? I think it's a good idea. Read it, read it to the baby. Uh, some people claim nowadays that, you know, my baby sleeps really good in church. He's used to your voice. And then the baby gets born and they bring the babies in and all I have to do is start talking. And they go out, <laughs> they go to sleep. You say, what is that? I, I believe that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't believe you can in, uh, saturate them with enough of it. You say, but it's brainwashing. Absolutely. What do you think the other stuff going in your eyes is doing? <laughs> all the stuff you see on the box and on the internet and all that, what do you think they're doing? They've learned something you haven't learned. And that is, it does matter what you look at, what you think, what you hear. It affects then the direction and how you go and the decisions that you make. Uh, the question that you might want to say before you put your mouth in gear is, what would the Lord do? 
That's hard in an argument. Is that that's, that's where we live, right? I mean, I mean, one of them heated arguments, right? And, and you hear something, and your natural response is, and the Lord goes, "Now, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on." So, like, mm, that, Lord, I ain't. Mm -mm, mm -mm. And He's talking. Don't tell me He's not talking to you. <laughs> and unless the Holy Spirit's grieved, you know how hard that is, isn't it? When somebody has something contrary, you've already made up your mind how they feel about something. So you know what you're doing? You're looking for them to do something to justify what you've been thinking. You already know. You've already made a judgment. I know what that person's thinking. So then guess what happens? The devil allows something to think. Not connected at all, but you done made up your mind what it is. Your filter's busted. You're not giving them the benefit of the doubt. Woo, boy. I must be on something. You say, well, I've already decided. Okay, well, what would the Lord do? All right, Matthew chapter number 9. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 4. Matthew chapter 9, verse number 4. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, wherefore think ye, look at it, evil in your... What, well, wait a minute. Thoughts, isn't that in your brain? Did you just say evil in your heart? Do you see that? You know what he just said? He said that the heart, when he refers to the heart, you know what he's saying? That's how you think. Do you think like Jesus thinks? Nobody thinks like Jesus thinks. Okay, okay that was a godly response. How about this for a response? How about, uh, let's go to uh, Acts chapter 11. How about this for a response? No, you know what? I recognize his thoughts are above my thoughts and his ways high above mine. And you know what? That's something I need to work on. You know what? Thanks for pointing that out. I realize I've got a deficit in that area. Don't tell me that's not a problem, ladies and gentlemen. People say all the time, how you think is controls when it comes to prosperity. They're always trying to get you to think about prosperity and having things and equating things to certain stuff. And that's why your television is full of advertisements and advertisements and advertisements. And then you get on the internet. I don't care. You can look up John 3.16. Advertisements. Advertise. It might even be religious advertisement. You've got to have this t-shirt. You need this scripture verse. You need this pen and pencil set. You need this new Bible version. You need this. You need this. If you get all these things and equip yourself with these things, why, you'll be a good Christian. Right? And the Lord said, that's why I'd rather you just pick up your Bible and read it. You say, why? There's no advertisements. You know why there's no pictures? Because pictures affect how you think. All I have to do is, is say the word apple. What do you see? You say, I say A-P-P-L-E. No, you don't. No, you don't. You see whatever your favorite apple is. If it's a Granny Smith or if it's a Red Delicious or if it's a, a Pink Lady or, or whatever the other ones that are out there, that are, there's tons of them out there now, all different kinds of hybrids. You just saw an apple. Maybe you saw a red apple with two little, a stem and two little leaves on it and uh, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Or maybe you saw putting it on your teacher's desk. You saw an apple. You saw an apple. But you didn't see it with your eyes. You saw the image in your head. The Lord doesn't have pictures in the Bible for a reason. He's trying to shape how you think. Imagine that. You're reading the Bible and you're getting God's impression of the pictures you should have in your mind. You say, well, well, why? well, why is He giving you so much stuff on thoughts? The Lord's sitting there talking to these fellows and He said, how come you imagine evil and He's reading their thoughts? How come you imagine evil in your hearts? So what's the problem? Their heart's like the bottom of a cesspool. Acts chapter number 11, verse number 23. The Bible said, Who when he came had seen the grace of God was exhorted uh, and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Purpose of heart? <laughs> what does that mean? If your heart's not in it, it ain't going to work. You can't do that with your head. You've got to make up your mind and your heart. That's it. When you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, watch. If thou confess uh, the Lord Jesus and believe in thine head, God hath raised him from the dead. See the difference in you have in your salvation and somebody of another religion is, is that they say all the time, well, I believe in the death of the burial and the resurrection. A resurrection. Which one of those? 
Your head or your heart? My dad used to say, I'm sure he got it from somebody else. I'm not saying he coined the phrase. He said a lot of people miss heaven by about 12 to 14 inches. He said a lot of them know it here, but they never got in here. He's making an illustration that it don't matter if you know it intellectually. It matters do you believe it where your heart is. If thou confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thine heart, God hath raised him from the dead. You say, why? With a heart man believeth. It's your heart. It's how you think. You say, it doesn't matter. You got a dirty heart. It's not just a dirty mind. It's a dirty heart. You remember the old uh, preacher's name was uh, Lester Roloff. Some of you old timers remember him. He was, uh, he was very, very well known. He helped a lot of drunks and drug addicts, but he was a great preacher. And he went against the state of Texas and the people that he was around trying to help those people out. And he wouldn't get a license to practice what they wanted to practice. And that's a whole long story. And he died with the honeybees in a bad uh, uh, thunderstorm one day and, and crashed his plane. But before, but before he died, Lester Roloff preached one of the greatest messages. I remember a bunch of them, and the mule walked on was a good one. That's Absalom getting caught underneath the tree and getting hung by his pride. That whole message in the mule walked on is about pride. It's not about long hair. Oh, yeah, Brother Roloff, all he did was preach on long hair. No, no, it wasn't about that. He didn't preach on long hair. He preached on Absalom being hung by his pride. And then the darts come in there. Man, I can tell you what. And he just, he'd pause every minute. Like Bob Jones Sr., he'd pause and he'd go, and the mule walked on. And then he'd go along and go along and show Absalom's problem. But he would draw attention that it was our problem. And he'd say, and the mule walked on. In other words, the mule went on, man, about his business. Where's Absalom? He's still swinging from his pride. And he hit that thing on pride and pride and pride. Well, he preached a message called Dr. Law and Dr. Grace. He preached that message out of uh, Romans 6. If you've never heard it, it's worth the however you do it. You've got to get with Lance or somebody how you download the thing and all that. I still don't know how to do all that stuff. I hear a message. I'm thinking, boy, that's a great message. I'd like to have that. Listen on a plane. Download. And then it's like, well, for $14.95, you can download this. And I'm thinking, for Fourteen ninety-five, and then if you say I'll take it at fourteen ninety, it's like okay. Now you have thirty days access, and if you don't get it, it's automatically rolled over, and it'll automatically renew whether you like it or you don't like it. And by the time you're done trying to get one message, the thing will cost you five hundred dollars. It's like I don't think I want to do that. Is there's got to be another way to do it? But I ain't figured it out yet. I just get frustrated with it. But that message is called Dr. Law and Dr. Grace. And what he talks about is, is a doctor that comes in there to do surgery and replace a black heart with a clean heart. And it's a great message, but it's a great illustration. If you don't clean out your heart, you're not going to think right. Some of you are not as demon-possessed as you are. you got a dirty heart. Well, I got Brother Larry and a half a dozen rest of you like, not me, man. I'm good. I'm, 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 I don't know who you're talking to, man. I'm swabbing mine out with Ajax every day. Okay, well, for the rest of us, you can have a dirty heart and not think a lascivious thing in the world. The issues in that Bible that have to do with emotions, that's in your heart. That's not in your head. You say, preacher, you sound like a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychiatrist, but you're schizo. You are whacked out. So you're going to tell me I need medicine? I'm not a doctor. I ain't prescribing nothing for you. You just need more Bible. Amen. But some of you read the Bible, but it's like, you know, the doctor gives you a prescription, but you don't take it. Amen. You read it, you don't take it. Right. Yes. Read the prescription every day. Yeah, I read that, man. That's really something. You going to take it? No, I ain't taking it. I read all about it, though. I know all it'll do are side effects. I know everything it'll do. I know if you take it too long and this will happen. Take it that long. I don't want to be this. I don't want to be that and all that kind of stuff. The next morning you get up and read that thing. Man, whew, boy, that's powerful medicine, man. You're still sick. You say, why? You don't take what you read every day. And you're Bible believers. And now some of you are mad at the doctor for trying to tell you, take your medicine. You say, it's to help you. You know, well, don't be so sarcastic. Stop being so touchy. Amen. Some of you, not, you've, gotten, you've gotten, that's something from the world where you've gotten to the point nobody can say anything without offending you about something. You're just always looking, somebody's out to get me. Listen, you got too much of the spotlight on your, you think you're more important than you really are. It's like, they're out to get me because I'm somebody. They're not out to get you. You know what you're going to wind up realizing? When you're a baby, you know what you do? Everybody takes care of you. It's all about you when you're a baby. 
You know what happens when you become a teenager? You think, hey, you know what? I got to get all my friends around me and find out what's about me. And then when you get into that little bit of adulthood, you realize all them teenagers, <laughs> they were thinking just like you. It never was about you. They were thinking about themselves and trying to use you. Well, grow up. So, so easily offended, you know. So it's, it's insanity nowadays what you will take from the world. But when the Bible runs cross strength, it's like, well, I, I don't believe you have a right to say that. Wow, you sure have changed. And all you have to do now is just stand up and give you what I'm giving you. And some of you are offended. <laughs> Preacher, we really like it because you talk straight. Well, until you get in my backyard. <laughs> Don't, don't come running around in the cupboards of my kitchen. The, the problem's the heart. That with their mouths they draw close to me, but with their heart they're a great way off. Right? That's our problem. Does not Jesus have your flesh? Who cares about your flesh? I'll tell you, who cares about it? You. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You washed it this morning and took care of it this morning and stuffed its little face this morning and gave it what it wanted. And you, look, you stood in front of the mirror and your flesh said, yeah, you look pretty good. Might could lose a couple pounds there, but you look pretty good. You know, I mean, just keep your jacket buttoned, you know. That's not, that's not bad, you know, as long as you keep the profile. Don't, don't turn the other way, you know. That's your flesh talking. You say, no, it's not. Oh, come on, ma'am. Come on now. You go sit down. Only her hairdresser knows. <laughs> what does your hairdresser know? Oh, you sit a woman or a man in a chair and go to snipping away at their pride. I mean, their hair. <laughs> no offense to all the hairdressers. I want to color it so I look younger. Ooh. <laughs> I don't care, man. Paint the barn. I think it's a great idea. I don't have any problem with that. I'm just, I said, this will have a contest. Who's the most spiritual by who wears the least makeup or jewelry? Hey, man, paint the barn, man. I mean, literally, even rotten wood looks good when you got paint on it. <laughs> I mean, that's why they make spanks. God bless you. <laughs> yeah, I haven't stepped off the deep end now, boy. <laughs> At least I haven't said anything about that other holy grail of age, you know, that kind of a deal. <laughs> but he does say the older women. Let them teach the younger women. How to love their husbands. Is that what they learn from you, old woman? They watch you and learn how to love your husband, do they? They watch you, ma'am, do what the Word of God says even when you don't like it so the Word of God's not blasphemed. Is that, is that what they find in you, ma'am? You sure your heart's not as black as a bottom of a rock on a 4th of July afternoon? Now, wait a minute, preacher. You're telling me I'm the problem. That's exactly what I'm telling you. Yes. I'm telling you that after you're saved, you are fully responsible for your actions. Yes. You now have a special individual living inside you that if you'd turn him loose, you can be all the things that you keep saying, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. It's just beyond me. I don't know how I can do it. I can do that. Okay, the Lord answered your question for you. I can do a few of the things. No, 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 no. All things. But here's the stipulation. Through Christ, you can't do it yourself. And the reason some of you are struggling so hard right now is because you're trying to do it yourself. You say, why? You're trying to keep your reputation alive. You're trying to keep you alive. You're trying to talk about, well, I mean, I might have done some things, but I ain't done everything. You don't want to get right with God. You know what? Some of you are right now. You wouldn't dare go back and accept your portion of the responsibility for the mess you're in. You say, why? You ain't got the guts for it. Yeah. You don't care if your heart's black. All you want to say is, well, preacher's is blacker than mine. 
or whoever else is lower on the totem pole. Sure, sure, yep. Your husband. Sure. Your wife. Yep. Come on. Some other person that's no longer around that you can throw shade on. Yep. Sure. That's a modern term for demean, put down, and belittle. We doing okay? Yes, sir. You, you, really, you really care about matters of the heart? Do you know what? You can't fix somebody else's heart. So why don't you just do surgery on your own? It's the one surgery he allows you to do. Look, if you will, in Acts chapter... I already gave you 11. All right, come to John chapter 16. Now, folks, this thing about walking in the Spirit, I, I, I realize that we, uh, you know, kind of, we, we kind of talk about it jokingly. Almost like it's this kind of like option. Walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. <laughs> but who don't fulfill the lust of the flesh? Okay, stop. It's not a joking matter. It's as serious as a sack full of rattlesnakes. It's literally the reason you're struggling right now. No, preacher, it's the environment. It's the jerk I'm married to. Okay. There's no helping you. There's no helping you. The Lord can't even help you. You say, why? You won't let Him. You know what the Lord likes? Even if you get upset with Him, the Lord likes it when you're straight with Him. The Lord knows you. Right? Right? And you come to him and you act like you're something you're not. You don't think he is, gets a hoot and nanny? Do you not think he sits up there? He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. <laughs> He'll have him in derision. You don't think he laughs at his own kids? You ever see your kids do something stupid and then when you find out they're not really hurt by the stupid thing, they do, you laugh with them. <laughs> you want to make sure they're not hurt bad right first. But then they do something and you're thinking... What an idiot, you know. And you get a laugh. Do you not think the Lord laughs at you? Do you not think the Lord every now and then look? Do you not think the Lord every now and then looks down at me and goes, What, what an idiot. You really think that? You think the Lord's just serious all the time? Oh, my poor child. I think he laughs. I think he needs to be able to keep himself uh, from getting too sober up there in heaven. I think he looks down sometimes and he looks at his creation and he looks at the ones that he saved. I think he looks down there and he sees Peacock and he laughs. <laughs> I guess he'd never laugh at you, would he? Because you, you, don't, you don't fit that category, do you? You're too busy straightening everybody else out for the Lord to be able to talk to you about you. I think some of your middle names is Jesus. John chapter number 16, verse number 22. This is a great verse. And ye now therefore have... Read it. Ye now for have what? But I will see you again, and your... Shall rejoice, and your joy no man... Oh, my goodness. You say, why do I want to have any joy? You got a heart problem. Some man took it away from you. You're going to allow a man to take away one of the most valuable things that you could ever be given by the Lord? The Bible, gave, the Bible says that the Lord gave you that joy, that your joy may be full. You say, what took it away? It wasn't him. The Bible says, I'll come, and when I'm coming, no man will ever take it from you. You say, what does that tell me? That tells me that men have the ability to take away one of the greatest attributes that the Lord ever gave somebody. Come to Galatians chapter 5. Come down to verse number 22. I think you'll find that in the top three, it's divided into nine fruits there, three at a time, right? Is that right? 522? Yes. The fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Right? Love. What's right behind it? Oh, you mean that's given to me, my God? Yeah. 
you look a few verses up there, you know what it'll show you? The works of the flesh. There's no joy there. You don't find any of the attributes there in the works of the flesh. Love, joy, peace. You ain't got no peace. Who took it from you? You worried about financial collapse? Man-made. You worried about an atomic bomb? Man-made. You worried about a war? Man-made. You worried about the cost of gasoline? Man-made. You worried about your health? Man-made. That's the flesh. Self-preservation. It's what I want. Me, 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 me. The Lord said, how about me for a change? But I want, but I want, but I want, I want, I want, I demand, I want, I want. Well, okay. You know what the Spirit says? I give, I give, I give, I give, I give. It's running through me to give out to other people. Running through me to give out to other people. You know what he says to the apostles? Take your Bible, if you will, please, and come to Hebrews chapter number 10. I'll give you this a little later on. Uh, he, I'll have to give you this tonight because we've got the children's coming in here in just a minute. Hebrews chapter 10. You know what he says the, uh, uh, um, to the um, apostles over there? They remembered not the miracle of the loaves for hardness of heart. They didn't remember how good God had been to see the miracle that He had done. And now they're in a storm and the Lord said, Did you forget what I already did for you? How did that happen? Heart got hardened off. When you get in trouble, don't you have a tendency to forget? I do. You get into trouble, it's hard to make that list of how good God's been, ain't it? The last time you thanked Him for the health you do have. Not the deficits. You know, not the scale. The health you do have. Lord, thank You for the eyes to see that I, I'm a few pounds over. Thank You, Lord. Appreciate that. Thank You for the food You provided for me that I overindulged in, but I sure enjoyed it. <laughs> when did you thank the Lord not for the deficit? When did you thank the Lord for what you do have? I can breathe. Some of you had the virus, and you come through the virus. You know what you said across the board? Some of you are like, I have, a, I have a hard time. I have a hard time breathing. It's hard to get a breath. I listened to Michael when he was getting there toward the end before they locked him down and did all the vent stuff and all that. He'd say, man, I can't hardly catch my breath, man. You say, what? Then thank the Lord I can still catch a breath. You ever think about it? Yes. Not what you don't have. You say, what is that? That's, that's covetousness. That's, I desire something that I don't already have. You ever think the Lord you can see? Yeah. And hear? Amen. Taste, I like that one. I can't imagine what it would be like not to have taste buds. Man, are you kidding me? Food be, all food be like eating cardboard? What a drag, man. That's why one of the greatest events up in heaven after the judgment seat is the marriage supper. Yes. Yeah. You say, why? He likens it to two most pleasurable things in life, a marriage and a supper. <coughs> I'm not saying your marriage is like a meal. I'm just saying <laughs> the Lord does that. But, but you ever think about that? You get up there and your taste buds haven't been affected by sin and the food that's laying there in front of you has not come from a cursed earth. Can you imagine well, why are you eating it? It's not to satiate. You don't need food to fill up anymore. It's for the taste. Amen. Oh, taste and see that the Lord, He is good. Well, how do you taste Him and see if you don't see what He's done for you? Is that them? All right. God bless you. We'll be done here in a second. <laughs>